Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last. All who are able, please stand and in, let us in praise say the call to worship. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Let us pray. Light of the world, you have come into the world's darkness, yet the darkness cannot overwhelm the light. Let your holy name be known through all the earth, that all people and nations may praise you and walk in your ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us remain standing as we sing hymn 274, O God of Earth and Space. If we say that we are without sin, then we are deceiving ourselves and we are simply not telling the truth. But when we confess our sins to God, God who is faithful and is just will forgive us and cleanse us of all of those ways in which we do fall short. So let us now confess our sins using the printed prayer. Open our hearts, O Lord, and enlighten our minds by the grace of your Holy Spirit 
that we may seek what is well pleasing to your will. And so order our doings after your commandments that we may be found fit to enter into your everlasting joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news of the gospel. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Jesus Christ. Christ who died for us. Christ who rose for us. Christ who reigns in power for us. And Christ who prays for us. The old life has died and a new life has begun. So know this. We are all forgiven. Be at peace. Amen. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from the God, our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are delighted to have each and every one of you visiting with us today. We're glad that you, and especially for those of you who are our guests, we're honored that you've come to worship with us here at First Presbyterian. And in order for us to be able to call you by name at the close of the service, if you would take the friendship pad that is in the pew in front of you and pass that down so that everyone may register their presence with us, we would be most grateful. And again, we thank you for your presence with us today. We also want to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us by way of television. We're grateful that you have invited us into your home and please know that while we worship here in the sanctuary, we are remembering you and your families in our prayers today. And thank you for joining us this morning. I want to share with you just a couple of announcements. First off, the Mother's Day shopping is both today and next Sunday. And if you would like to do something very special for Mother's Day, that will also go to helping our community soup bowl This would be a great time to do that. All of the donations received will go to help feed the hungry here in Tuscaloosa and hope that you'll prayerfully consider what you can do. And if you have any questions, there's more information about that in your bulletin or you can see Amy Perkins sometime today. And also, both the Tuscaloosa Habitat and the Perry County Sowing Seeds of Hope are in need of building volunteers. And if you could give your time this coming Saturday You'll see all of the details and contact information in your bulletin and hope that uh, if you can be a part of that effort, we would be grateful for your presence in doing that as well. Let's always pray for the mission endeavors of this congregation because while we put our efforts into it, we know that this is a work of God and we want his blessing and his fullness in all that we do in the lives that are going to be blessed. I want to invite now our children to come up for our word to the children. we are wise when we look both ways. Can you do that motion with me? Look both ways. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? We are wise when we look both ways when? Before we cross the 
before we cross the street, right? Our parents taught us that. We are wise. Sometimes, though, we are sneaky when we look both ways. Can you do that motion with me? We're sneaky when we look both ways, especially when we want to make sure nobody sees us before we take that extra cookie out of the cookie jar right before dinner, right? Or when we are sneaky and we look both ways to make sure our brother or sister doesn't see us borrow their favorite toy, right? You know what? And sometimes we are angry when we look both ways. Can you help me look both ways again, this way and that? We are angry when we look both ways before we kick or hit or shove somebody, right? When we do it out of anger, right? We want to make sure nobody sees us. Did you know that the young man, young adult Moses was angry when he looked both ways before he killed somebody who made him angry? That was pretty angry, huh? But you know what? Moses thought nobody saw him, and he went and hid the body, so he thought he was okay. But guess what? Somebody did see him, and he, God, God, but also some people on earth, and he knew he was in big trouble. When we look both ways, let us be wise, okay? Not sneaky or angry. Let us be wise. Because the God who created us wants us to be wise and kind to one another, all right? And not be sneaky or angry. Will you pray with me and repeat after me? God, let us be wise and kind to one another when we look both ways. Amen. And as those who are in kindergarten or pre-kindergarten go to be with godly play, I invite the rest of you to extend the right hand of Christian fellowship to your neighbor. Let's turn our hearts now to God in prayer. Gracious God, by your Spirit's power, open our hearts and our eyes so that we may behold wonderful things from your law. We thank you for giving us the gift of your Spirit that enables us to understand all that we see in your Word. And today we claim that promise in Christ's name. Amen. If you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 2, and I will begin reading in the 11th verse. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinfolk. He looked this way and that, And seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting. And he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
A lot of time has elapsed between verse 10 and verse 11. Moses has grown up. We left him as a baby. And then in verse 11, he is a young adult. Having raised in the household of Pharaoh, we really know very little about what happened between verse 10 and verse 11. But this passage gives us an idea about who Moses was, the type of person he was, and the character that the man possessed. We find out first off in verse 11 that he knew who he was. He was a Hebrew. You'll notice how many times it says his kinfolk or his people. So he was not unidentified with his own folks, even though he was raised in Pharaoh's household. Somehow or another along the way, he was taught and he learned who his family really was. And so he identified with them. He knew them and he saw them as family, as kinfolk. And then it also says he saw their forced labor. He sees what's going on with them. And already at this early stage, we see Moses has a sense of the injustice that was happening to his own people. He looked at their forced labor. He saw the cruelty that was being put on them day after day as they toiled and labored in the fields and in the hot sun, making brick and tending Pharaoh's crops and for the whole nation. And so he understood the sense of injustice that was going on with his people. And on this particular day, as he goes out, he sees what was probably one of the Egyptian taskmasters beating up a Hebrew. And it was more than he was just being roughed up. This Egyptian was out to kill him. Because when Moses strikes back at the Egyptian, the same word is used. And so Moses was doing to the Egyptian exactly what the Egyptian was doing to the Hebrew. He was beating him up and killing him just like the Egyptian had done to the Hebrew. It really shows a sense of Moses' injustice because this was not a knee-jerk reaction. Moses didn't see this going on and then just automatically, without thinking, jump into this fray. Instead, he looked one way and then the other. He thought about it. He took time to meditate on what was going on. And then he acted and killed the Egyptian and buried him, thinking that was the end of it. Now there's a problem here. Moses' sense of injustice was not adequate for the occasion. He was not going to free his people. He was not going to release them. He was not going to enable them to get back to the, the land that had been given to his ancestors by killing this Egyptian. Moses had the sense of injustice. Maybe he even sensed this was something God might want. But he acted on his own. He acted thinking he was doing the right thing. And it only ended up getting him exiled to Midian and one Egyptian dead. That was not going to free the people. If you and I are going to live God-centered lives, we have to first come to an understanding of the purpose of God that trumps our plans. Moses saw the injustice and he acted. And people throughout the scriptures did this. It was a kind of a do something reality. You know, don't just stand there, do something. So he killed the Egyptian. But that do-something mentality does not always fit in to God's purpose, and it did not here. If we're going to have a God-centered life, we first have to understand God's purpose over our plans. God had a plan and a purpose. God saw the people. He saw the injustice 
being, that was tearing them apart and brutalizing them. God saw what was going on, and God had a plan to deliver them. But first, God had to bring Moses into a vital relationship with himself for him to be able to understand the purpose God had for saving his people. Now, if I were to ask you the question, who delivered the people from Egypt? Was it God or was it Moses? God did. God delivered them. But his plan was to first enter into a relationship with Moses and then through Moses deliver his people. And that is the pattern that God always works and uses in Scripture. When God made the decision that he was going to flood the earth, what did he do? He went to Noah. He told Noah his plan, his purpose, and through Noah saved his family and saved all humankind through Noah's family. When Jesus was here to establish his kingdom, he had been teaching that the kingdom of God was come, the kingdom of God was a reality. He was teaching them about the kingdom. And when the, and when the cohort from the temple came to arrest him, Peter, thinking this mentality that, oh yeah, we're going to establish a kingdom, sought to on his own to establish that kingdom, pulled his sword and started swinging it at anybody who could hit, he could hit, and kill and do them in. And what did Jesus do? Stop, Peter. Impetuous Peter, put the sword back. That's not how my kingdom is going to be established. That's not how this is going to work. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. Put the sword away. God's plan and purpose for establishing God's kingdom here on this earth was not going to be by a sword. It was going to be by him sacrificing his own son, brutalizing his own son, nailing his own son to a cross, and rising his son from the grave in order to bring salvation to all humankind. It wasn't going to be by a sword. And Moses had a lesson to learn, and it took him 40 years to learn it, but he learned it. And God brought Moses into a vital relationship with himself. And then, through Moses, delivered his people from Egypt. In Psalm 81, the scripture says, the psalmist talks about the Exodus account and deliverance. And it says in Psalm 81 that God said to his people, I am the Lord your God. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. He wanted them to know that the oppression that they had experienced in Exodus did not go unnoticed. That God continues to this day to care for His people and to look after His people. God continues to provide us with all that we need. And if we will keep the Lord our God and open wide our mouth, He'll fill us with, for, with every need that we have. God will look after us. God will take care of us. There was a man in 19th century England who took that scripture and ran with it. George Mueller was a German immigrant to England. And in 1935 in Bristol, he saw the need that was before him and the whole city of orphan children. Many of them were running wild in the streets and others were in the workhouses and being treated brutally and, and mistreated and abused in such horrific ways. The state of the church in Bristol at that time was not good. It was at a very low ebb. People were discouraged. People had no sense of the power of God in their lives or in their churches. They were, they were down and downcast. And it was in Mueller's mind that he was going to show the church that God could still take care of them, that God would supply every need. 
He wanted a demonstration to be able to show the church that God was still on His throne. And he saw the need for these children, and God led him to start an orphanage. And he announced what he was going to do. He was a pastor of a small church in Bristol, certainly not a church of means or, or of well-being. But he announced that he was going to start an orphanage, and this is how he was going to do it. He wasn't going to tell anybody any need that he had. He wasn't going to advertise or campaign to raise money or resources for this endeavor. He told them that he was simply going to petition God with every request that he had, with every need that came before him in taking care of the, the orphans, and God was going to show himself. Mueller started out. And the stories that came out of that experience astound us even today. At the time when he had 64 children under his care, that he was housing, that he was feeding them, he was cleaning them, when at this time when he was taking care of 64 children, he brought them to breakfast. There, were no, there was no food in the house. The children came and they sat down and they, they had their plates in front of them, their silverware in front of them, their glasses in front of them, but there was no food in the house. So Mueller gave the blessing. He asked the children to bow their heads, and he began to thank God for the food that He would provide. And before he got to the Amen, knock came to the door. It was the baker. He said God had woken him up in the middle of the night and told him that he ought to bake bread for the orphanage. And he was standing there with all this bread to feed the children. And before they could even give out the bread to all of the kids, another knock came to the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broke down in front of the orphanage. The wheel had fallen off. And he knew that if he went to get the, what he needed to repair the cart, that by the time he got back, all of the meal, milk would be gone and stolen. And so he said, rather than have my milk be stolen, I'm going to give it to you for the children here in the orphanage. And God provided all that they needed to take care of those children and give them the food that they needed for breakfast. Over and over again, God demonstrated His love for those children and for the people in Bristol and, in, and showed that He could take care of them. That if they would just open wide their mouth, He would fill every need that they had. By the time Mueller died in 1998, at the age of 92, he had been responsible and caring for over 10,000 children in Bristol. Not only did he care for them and put a roof over their head, not only did he feed them and did he clothe them, but he educated them as well. And by that time, he had established 117 schools that had educated over 120,000 children in Bristol. And you know what the criticisms were? You know there was bound to be criticism. People were saying that he was raising these children above their station in life. That was the criticism. The factory owners were criticizing him because they were having a hard time finding labor because all of the children that they had fed on to run their factories and their mines were being housed and clothed and fed and educated. And they were having a hard time finding labors for their factories. Thus the criticism. When Mueller died in 1898, all of Bristol shut down. Factories closed. Shops closed. Pictures of the event show people climbing the lamppost to be able to get a look as his funeral procession went by, paying their last respects to this man that had shown them so much about the power of God. The streets were lined three and four deep on both sides as people poured out of the factories and shops to pay their respects and give honor to this man who had taken care of so many of them and of so many of the children of Bristol. 
The Bristol Times wrote in his obituary that George Mueller came around for such a time for the purpose of showing us that the day of miracles had not passed. Mueller showed what the power of God can do. If you do it under your own steam and under your own power, what you're going to get is simply human effort and human results. But if you trust God, if you understand God's purpose and do it God's way, then what you're going to get in the result is God-sized results. What did Moses accomplish this day? He killed one Egyptian. And if he had proceeded down that road, the, the chances that thousands, if not tens of thousands, of his own people would have been slaughtered by Pharaoh's army. They were already paranoid about the Hebrews being in their land. And if he had started an armed rebellion, tens of thousands could have died as a result of Moses' action. Moses trying to deliver his people his way. But God said, I'm going to deliver my own people and I'm going to do it my way. Do you know how many people God lost in His deliverance of, his, of the people? None. None. No Hebrew was lost. Not only was no Hebrew lost, but as they left Egypt without even a knife in their pocket, much less a sword, they plundered the land and people threw the wealth of Egypt on them as they left and walked out. When Moses entered into a vital relationship with God and understood God's purpose and went about it God's way, the result was God-sized. And the whole nation left Egypt and walked out. The whole nation was saved. And God showed Himself that He is a God of might, that He is a God who cares and loves His people. And the lesson for us today is always that has never changed, that has never wavered. God still cares and loves us. God still gives us the promise that if, if you will recognize Me as the Lord your God and open wide your mouth, I will fill it. Mueller demonstrated it for the people of England to see what God could do. Moses demonstrated it in front of his people over and over again to look and see what God can do. Enter into that kind of relationship with the Lord. Trust Him. Believe that He cares for you. Understand that He loves you. And put your faith and trust in what God can do. And Jesus will make Himself real to you. You will know His provision and His care. You will know of His love that never fails, His love that is everlasting. These were the promises for Moses and for His people. And it's the promise that God gives to us, His people, today. Thanks be to God. Squunched together up here is an especially tight confirmation class. I'm going to call them each by name. They're going to come up and receive their Bibles and line up before me, and then I'll offer them and you up a charge. They have already gone before our session. Our session enthusiastically and unanimously, unanimously approved them into membership of the church. And so we are very excited to receive them into full membership at First Presbyterian Church. So here now as I call up these confirmands and their partners up front. Emmy Barnett and partner Christy Beam. Annabelle Beavers and partner Vicki Holt. Mary Evelyn Beavers and partner Jim Rosenfeld.
Ty Beam and partner Carlos Vieira. I tried to get it right. <laughs> Anna Grace Borman and Cal Holt. Cal has agreed to stand behind Anna Grace as her Sunday school teacher. Uh, her partner is Jennifer Smith, but she could not make it today. Davis Bowers and partner Mike Henderson. Emery Grace Edwards and partner Laura Hubbard. Grace Evans and partner Jacqueline Morgan. Jesse Kate Joyner and partner Sarah Kaler. Emily Keller and lost my place, partner Michelle Beck. Francis Lehman and partner Jennifer Wilson. Camille Murray and partner Lillian Beavers. Maria Potts and partner Amanda Fowler. Meredith Vaughn and partner Margaret Goodlett. And Mary Margaret Wilson and partner Krista Hackney. A couple things I'm going to say to this confirmation class. First, I want to commend Ty and Davis. They're uh, especially brave. This is a great confirmation class. I had a chance to start working with them in November. And I can tell you, let me tell you something about this class. They are Presbyterians. When we had them go to other services, they would come back and we would talk about the other services they would attend and worship services. And they were great worship services. But I remember one time when they came back after a worship service, they said, there was no confession of faith. There was no assurance of pardon. And I thought to myself, yes. <laughs> These are Presbyterians right here. Fully active members of First Presbyterian Church. So I want to offer up a charge to them and a charge to you. First of all, to you 15. First of all, speak up. Each one of you, we've said this over and over and over again, but I can't say it to you enough. Each one of you has amazing and wonderful gifts to offer to this church. You are a member of this church. You are not the future of the church. You are the here and now of this church. Make your voice be heard. I've heard your voices up in that confirmation room. You have great things to offer, but also listen. Listen to the wise counsel of this congregation who wraps you in their arms. Listen to what they have to say to you. Listen to your partners who stand behind you and know that we always will stand behind you. And to you, con uh, congregation of First Presbyterian Church, I say to you, speak up. Teach them, love them, speak to them, and tell them what you have to say. But also listen. Listen to them. Because I can tell you each one of these 15 have amazing gifts to offer this church. And just like I said to them, it's easy for us to say that they're the future, but they have so much to offer us now. Speak and listen. I'm going to ask you the constitutional questions. I'll ask that you respond to them, and then Luann Sellers is going to offer up a confirmation prayer for y'all. Confirmation class of 2014-15, who is your Lord and Savior? Do you renounce evil and affirm your reliance on God's grace? Do you? And do you declare your intention to participate actively and responsibly in the worship and mission of this church to you? Let us pray. 
How great is your love, Lord God, how wide is your mercy. By the love of Jesus Christ, you draw people to faith and bring them into the church family. May we show your joy by embracing these newly confirmands who with us believe and with us will work to serve you in all that we do. Keep us close together in your spirit as we are called to use the gifts you give each day, to work for justice every hour and to break bread in faith and love as we follow in the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us stand together with the confirmation class and their partners as we all affirm what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. What do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I welcome you, 2014-2015 Confirmation class, to full active membership in the life of First Presbyterian Church. You may go in peace and be seated. I want to lift up the concerns of our church this day. Uh, Bill Plott is now at home after spending some time at DCH. We also um, lift up Ann Baker, who is Hugh Somerville's sister. She is also now at home. We continue our prayers for Kanye Witongo, who is uh, at Children's Hospital. For Walt Dinsmore, who's going to be going to Durham, North Carolina, for a couple of surgeries here this week. Uh, and in the coming weeks, we certainly lift up Walt and his family as they travel up to North Carolina. We also lift up our prayers to Mary Ella Wolf, uh, for Mary Ella Wolf, who is recovering from extensive surgery this past week in Atlanta. Uh, I believe she is uh, back here in Tuscaloosa, but it, the recovery is going to be a long time. So we, we need to think about Mary Ella and for the Wolf family. We also lift up our prayers for Abigail Grant, who continues in an out-of-town rehab facility, for Lucy Collier, who is in Forest Manor Rehab, for Peggy Minning's uncle, and for Christy Thompson's son-in-law. And also, yesterday was a big day for, the, for many folks in Tuscaloosa for our 2015 graduates. And it's an exciting time, but I can also tell you, knowing many of these graduates, that it is a very anxious time as well. As many are trying to figure out what happens after Tuscaloosa. So we lift up our 2015 graduates. Let us go to God as together we pray. Almighty God, as the seasons change with hints of summer dangling in the air, we are mindful of changing seasons in our own lives. Children washed clean in baptismal waters. Confirmation students lending their voices to the church as the, ch as the church listens to what they have to say. High school seniors anxiously awaiting graduation while graduating undergrads, masters, and PhD candidates 
anxiously await whatever is next. Men and women alike anticipate stating marriage vows, and it goes on and on and on. Some changes are welcome. Some we deal with. Others we fear. A doctor's appointment, a pink slip, a broken trust, a guilty verdict, a peace to end. We don't always know where life will take us, but we are hopeful because we know you to be faithful, true, and steadfast. You will never leave nor forsake us. Your spirit guides us, empowers us, and strengthens us for the journey. So whatever the season, whatever the time or place where we find ourselves, Lord, please be present with us as we move forward. Give us ears to listen, eyes to see, and hearts broken open for the world that we might be your people, following in the way, the truth, and the life known to us through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bringing God's tithes and our offerings, we do so with gratitude for your faithfulness in giving to the one great hour of sharing offering. If you have not already given and would like to do so, it is not too late. And we thank you for your faithfulness. Let us continue now to honor God, remembering what the scripture says, that the tithe is the Lord's.
Let us pray. Living God, we give thanks for the blessings with which you have entrusted us. We ask that a portion be used to touch the world so that this world begins to look more like your kingdom. Long ago, faithful women, having witnessed an empty tomb, proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them, that our witness may be as bold, our love as deep, and our faith as true. Amen. Let us remain standing as we sing hymn 339, Be Thou My Vision. Now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is able, and he will do it. Amen. <laughs> 